the whole presentation. So my name is Nikita Ivanov. Um, <clears throat> I'm part of several Apache projects, namely uh, the NLP Craft and uh, Apache Ignite. Uh, my day job actually is all about Apache Ignite. I'm founder and CTO of a company behind Apache Ignite Ingredient Systems. But today we're going to be talking about NLP Craft. And uh, let's jump in without further ado so that we don't lose much time. So, uh, so in this session, we're talking about NLP Craft, and I'll basically show a pretty cool example in a, in a second part of that. And NLP Craft, is fairly, NLP Craft is a fairly mature project that has been developing for a number of years, yet it's a very new project for uh, Apache Software Foundation, um, and it's currently undergoing incubation in SF. NLP Craft provides a, what I would call a fresh and unique take on one of the most exciting parts of a natural language processing, namely a natural language interface to the applications. Now, this talk is split in two parts. In the first 10 to 15 minutes, whatever we have left, um, I'll talk about what NLP Craft is and isn't, what are some of the unique ideas and how to work to the high level and how it's different from many existing approaches. In the second part, I'll sort of try to provide a proof around the key claims I made in the first part of the presentation. The proof is in the pudding because the saying goes. So we'll look at some of the um, pretty cool example that is packaged with NLP Craft. Uh, specifically, we're going to add a natural language interface to a very popular computer game called Minecraft. And if you have kids uh, in this, some age group from 5 to 15, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's a pretty cool game. It's a job not in the computer gaming industry. What's really cool about Minecraft is that it has you know, a Java edition that is very extensible and pluggable. And that's exactly what we're going to use. And I'll show you an example of how it can be done in NLP Craft very effectively. So without further ado, let's jump in. So one of the first things that I think we need to clarify is the distinction between the general processing of natural language as an academic discipline and a specific task of providing a spoken and written interface using natural language comprehension. Now, NLP, natural language processing, is a half a century old umbrella term that historically grew out of computer and mathematical linguistics. It sort of principally deals with the techniques and technologies that for the what I call the automatic manipulation of spoken written natural language. It includes dozens of different approaches from, you know, speech recognition and grammar correction to various forms of statistical analysis and, um, and the, you know, documents and, and speech. As such, an LP field consists of a dazzling, you know, variety of different technologies and frameworks and libraries and projects. Now, natural language interface, on the other hand, is a specific application of NLP that deals squarely with the idea of providing an application interface that is based on a comprehension of a natural language. It is often called, you know, question answer systems, chatbots, AI systems, and so on. So what's so special about natural language? Um, it turns out the natural language interface has a set of unique advantages that I believe sort of are quickly important to mention here. First of all, when you think about it. The natural language interface is the only possible interface that's sort of really uniform and homogeneous across any data models, square languages, any other proprietary interfaces. In fact, take you know, any two or more sufficiently different software systems and you will quickly realize that often the only common human interface between them would be the one based on speech or text communication. Another often overlooked yet obvious advantage of natural language interface is the fact that well, everybody knows it. This is absolutely unique in software engineering because practically any other human interface has to be learned at some point. Uh, but when it comes to language, almost any, almost every human being living on this planet can speak it and write it instantly. It's a powerful statement when you think about it. And we already seen some results from, you know, Siri, Alexa, and so on. And the last point I'd like to make is that, you know, the fact that for many modern devices, you know, like mobile and better devices, wearables, the spoken language interface is often the only practical choice simply due to inherent limitations of those devices. This makes natural language interface particularly suited for modern applications and uh, modern future applications and devices. So with this background information in mind, let's take a closer look at the functionality graph. So on this slide, um, we will cover some high level picture. On a, and on the following slide, we'll talk a little bit more about details and key differences in unique capabilities. So what is Apache NLP Craft? Apache NLP Craft is a free open source library for adding the main specific natural language interfaces to modern applications. You can define a model in intents using any GVM-based languages like Java, Scala, Groovy, Kotlin, 
As a matter of fact, you know, the whole project is built in Scala, but our example today is built in Kotlin. And uh, your applications can use REST APIs to REST API to explore natural data using natural language. So let's unpack this a little bit. Uh, first of all, I'll take Rust part of itself, an enhanced license under the Apache 2.0 open source license. Um, NLP Craft is what I would call laser focused on developing a, a, a very specific domain, what are called domain specific natural language interface for particular applications versus attempting to build some sort of a general artificial intelligence capability. This is actually one of the key, you know, okay, philosophical differentiating characteristics of NLP Craft, and we'll talk about it in a little bit separate section, section two. Um, and also, unlike, you know, most NLP libraries today, especially the low level libraries that kind of have a strong academic background and sort of a, what I usually call a bucket of Lego pieces flavor with Python. It's a, and I think Raptor is built from the ground up, you know, based on a modern Java ecosystem and really tailor made for this kind of rapid commercial software development where engineering efficiency is really important. So let's take a closer look at the actually main component of this picture in the slide. So let's start with a data model. Um, the NLP craft employs what's, what is called a model as a code approach, where the entire data model is part of your source code. Data model is simple implementation of Java interface that can be developed using any JVM programming languages. Again, Java, Scala, Kotlin, and Groovy, whatever you like. Data model, data model defines named entities, various configuration properties, as well as intents to interpret the user input. To make use of data model, it has to be deployed somewhere. And Typically, we deploy it in data prop. And data prop is a lightweight container. Let's write this in the picture, uh, right in the middle of this picture in the slide, um, that is designed to securely deploy and manage user data models. Each data prop is deployed and manage, can deploy and manage multiple models, and many props can connect to the REST server. Uh, the main purpose of data prop is to separate data model hosting from managing REST calls from a client applications. And while you would typically have just one REST server in the system, you can have multiple data props deployed in different geolocations and configured differently. So data props can be deployed and run anywhere as long as there's the ingress connectivity from the REST server, typically deployed in DMZ close to your target data source, where it's, whether it's in premise or in the cloud. Now, the data props use strong encryption and ingress only connectivity uh, for communicating with the REST server. And finally, the REST server. Uh, the REST server provides essentially URL endpoint for the Android application to securely query data sources using natural language via data models that deployed in data props. Uh, it's the main purpose to accept REST or HTTP calls from the end user and route this request to and from requested data props. And unlike data props, it gets restarted every time model is changed. So data props is fairly, you know, um, non-mutable. Uh, like for example, during developing the REST, REST server, on the other hand, is kind of a fire and forget component. It can be launched typically once and it basically stays there forever. So once again, this is actually an important picture because we're gonna use all of these components in our example, I'm gonna show it to you. So we're gonna use a, we're gonna have a model, we're gonna deploy it in data prop, and we're gonna have a REST server, you know, and actually quite a, bit, quite a few more components from Minecraft as well. Okay, so with this, uh, sort of a quick overview in LP graph. Let's talk about, this is about the only last slide I have, by the way. We're gonna quickly, so just gonna check the time. We're gonna switch to a um, little bit more interesting parts, but let me sort of uh, talk about the key features. And I'm on, I'm, I know I'm going pretty fast, so a lot of this kind of goes by, and hopefully um, you guys can grab some pieces of information from this kind of quick talk and uh, maybe read up later on the website as well. But let me talk about some of the key features again, pretty, pretty quickly, because each and one of them can be in a one hour conversation of its own. So let's, you know, start with a bit of a history. It will give you sort of background, you know, how the NLP crop and some of the decisions architecturally and feature wise were made. So when the team, uh, the original team was envisioned NLP craft a number of years back, one of the driving motivators uh, behind it was really a dissatisfaction with the existing status quo of NLP systems. And if any of you guys worked in NLP system, NLP, you know, world in the last decade, you probably will, you know, pretty much relate to it. So that NLP system back then and today can be characterized by a pr proliferation of a how can I have half baked project addressing esoteric academic research topics, focusing on, you know, what I call the low level problems while at the same time trying to solve high level tasks of language comprehension, for example, leaving you know, many of its users in 
uh, of those frameworks uh, with a large amount of heavy lifting and daunting development tasks. It also didn't help, and still doesn't help, that most of these frameworks and libraries were using old Python, which simply isn't very suitable for the modern enterprise software development. On the other hand, the commercial offerings like Serial X, Dialog, Low Cartana were all extremely closed in, and still closed in, by the way, for most of them, proprietary and very limited in the feature set. You know, it's also you know, instructive, instructive to remember that in the last five years, we went through the whole phase and fascination with chatbots that kind of ended as quickly as it started. Yet another problem plaguing this community, and this is, by the way, in my opinion, one of the, one of the most significant problems, in, at least in the last decade, is this what I call the semi-automatic reflexive to shoehorn every problem into the mold of neural networks and cast every solution in the light of statistical linguistics. And while for many applications like sentiment analysis, name identity detection, in translation, speech recognition, the probabilistic approach is valid, even if you ignore this kind of massive time sink that prepare and maintaining custom corpus and training data sets. Most of the real life enterprise natural language interfaces simply cannot work in a probabilistic way. This is actually something that the, the team here learned you know, pretty, pretty early on in the project life. Uh, so let me give you an example to this straightest point, because sometimes it's a very controversial, not a very controversial, but sometimes people take it as a controversial point. Um, imagine, for example, while a let's say, typical business user would happily accept the probabilistic results for sentiment analysis, in fact, it doesn't really matter if you say your Twitter feed is 85 or 87 percent positive at a given time, as long as they're turning in the right direction. The same business user will simply reject the system that, for question, let's say, what is my average sale price last quarter, gives not exact answer. Most, if not all, business analytics and operations cannot operate on a probabilistic basis. Just imagine, you know, you walked in the bank and asking for your account balance, and in a, in a clerk in the bank tells you that you most likely have a hundred bucks in your account, right? It doesn't work like this in real life, and it doesn't work for man, many, if not most, business analytics. It, the, the, the probabilistic nature doesn't work. You have to be deterministic. You have to be able to say, Yes or no, you gotta give, give the answer and the proper answer or not give the answer. Given the answer that's probabilistic, that's, you know, one or two percent probability of error is just not gonna work. So all this issue, an early teething problem resulted in a hard to use, you know, overly complicated arcane field to most of the NLP frameworks and libraries that sort of seemingly require an inordinate amount of time to develop something tangible and useful. So that was at the backdrop behind the ideas that led NLP craft to NLP craft development. And uh, I, when I speak about this project, you know, and I always give this example that some of us can remember the enterprise Java beans in the Java ecosystem back in, you know, almost 20 years ago, and then came Spring. And that was the same kind of, you know, revelation that, you know, you can do things in a, in a dramatically easier and more efficient way than this kind of monolithic cathedral EGB architecture. And I believe that, you know, the NLP, natural language processing, is going through the same phase where um, a lot of people realizing that, you know, the kind of old approaches are not effective and the cost effective anymore and something, you know, different has to be developed. So NLP craft is part of that trend, if you will. So essentially, uh, we decided to build a framework that would focus solely on solving one single problem and solving it in a kind of most efficient and productive way. How to build a natural language interface to modern application. That's the one problem that NLP craft solves. None of those different NLP related subjects and topics, just one particular problem, how to build an interface that is based on a natural language. So to accomplish this, we decided to ditch Python naturally and develop NLP craft in Java ecosystem. We use model the code approach I mentioned before, where everything you do in NLP craft is part of your source code that you can simply check and git, similar to the modern, you know, you know configurations of the code ideas and whatnot. The main APIs of NLP Craft, which I'll show you today quickly, uh, really consist of a few dozen interfaces that you can learn less than an hour. Uh, NLP Craft uses annotation to bind the user intents to the callback. Again, we'll see that, which is very automatic Java way. You know, most of the examples of shipped with NLP Craft are like literally 100 lines of code, which, you know, you can easily see. NLP Craft comes with advanced command line management utility and with interactive wrap-up mode, which is very nice and it's very common in, in this day and, uh, day and age. Uh, NLP Craft hides most of the low level NLP processing and complexity from the user, which is actually some of the unique characteristic. Uh, yet provides its own set of normalized name and recognizers. 
it also support all the different list of uh, third-party providers you see on this, you know, on this slide, from Spicy to Stanford Core NLP, from actually sister project in Apache Open NLP, or Google um, language APIs. Uh, NLP Craft also provides a very advanced out-of-the-box support for maintaining and managing conversation context. It's one of the Achilles heel of a lot of NLP systems. Um, that conversation management is fully integrated with a built-in intent matching. Um, NLP Craft, you know, short-term memory is what it's called. It's, I think Believe is a real breakthrough implementation for this idea. Uh, this is one of the goals, one of the few things in NLP Craft that are essentially really cutting edge NLP research. And finally, uh, probably the crown jewel of NLP Craft is really it's a full deterministic NLP intent matching, NLP Craft intent, ma intent matching. Uh, it is based on IDL, which is the intent definition language. It's a custom language that exists within the LP crowd that to, to really define a uh, non-trivial intent, which we're actually going to be able to see some of that today. So uh, that's enough talking. I think we've talked about for 15 minutes. So let me uh, sort of a, uh, give you a quick um, look at the, what we're going to be doing, for example. Now, this is going to be a little bit more involved. It's a couple hundred lines of code. I'm not going to be able to write anything in front of you, but we're going to just take a look. So we're going to add, you know, I'm going to show you how to add uh, on this example. And by the way, this example is fully available uh, on the website. You can just take a look at it on the Apache NLP Craft website. It's right there. You can take a look at it. So what we're going to do is that uh, the Minecraft as a game comes as a basically client server architecture. It's a, it's a, especially Java edition of it, uh, it has the server, it has the client. The client essentially is a game, right? And we're going to be able to, we need to start essentially four components. So we need to start a uh, Minecraft server. We need to start all the necessary uh, uh, NLP craft components, which is essentially NLP craft server, which is server, uh, REST server, NLP craft prob with a Minecraft model. And then we're going to start a, uh, the game itself. It's all we're going to connect to the game server, which in itself connects to the REST server and, and the data prop, right? So it's a fairly complicated, kind of convoluted kind of you know, uh, structure, but nonetheless, four components, we need to start them all and see if it works. So let's go ahead and start it right now, and I'll basically walk you through the code and everything else uh, that we need to do. So, uh, as a matter of fact, I already have, uh, you guys can, let me just double check, you guys can see it. Yeah, you can see it. So, um, uh, I already have a uh, Minecraft server. That's a basically a, a very simple, um, I believe it's a Java application. And we can go ahead and um, I hope you guys can see most of it. Basically, it's uh, what I have here. You have a, a, a latest release of NLP Craft, essentially as my project and idea. Hopefully you guys can see it. When I'm going to look in the code, I'm going to I'm going to zoom it in. What we're going to do, we're just going to start the two components again. There's multiple ways you can start these components, right? NLP Craft. Probably the easiest way is to do it through our just an NLP Craft shell script. That's a wonderful REPL system that you can basically play very easily with. I'm going to just go ahead and start it from my idea. So I have my server here. Uh, and it's just going to start the server. And while it's starting, I'm going to start my probe with a Minecraft model. Again, all instructions are available to you guys, uh, but it's pretty, it's pretty self-explanatory. So the probe starts very quickly. Uh, server takes about half a minute to start, has a lot of machinery. That's why you don't really start it. So uh, we're going to wait until we connect to the server. Uh, and here we are. So the probe started. You know, if you can look at here, you can see that basically we started the probe. Uh, we launched. We'll deploy it. We deployed one model here, and everything is connected. So we've loaded up Minecraft model. There's a bunch of statistics here, how many synonyms and whatnot, and we're fully uh, connected to the server. And if we look at the server, same story here, right? Everything is connected and wired up. The server has the one probe connected, and essentially it has this model deployed in the server. So once again, for the purpose of this example, obviously I'm running it locally in real life. You can run it any way you like. As long as there is any in internet connectivity, you guys, um, everything can connect it. So now we have essentially three components running. Uh, the Minecraft server right here and the two components in idea. We're going to go ahead and start Minecraft. 
Um, and that's essentially a Minecraft uh, launcher. It's kind of game launcher. It's a normal game that anybody can play. We pick here the right uh, release, which is we use the uh, Minecraft server from Forge. Click play. It loads up pretty quickly. And uh, somehow jumping away from a different, you know, monitor for me. And we're in the game. So what I noticed actually uh, when I was uh, playing with this yesterday, uh, I have some problem with my local connectivity. So yeah, so for some reason, like every quest takes like a few seconds to complete, uh, which I didn't really uh, debug it, but uh, something we can work it out. So. Uh, this is the main screen. Just go to multiplayer. Uh, it detects the local server. That's how we connect it. This is exactly this server right here. That's, you know, we're trying to connect to. And if we say join the server, we're going to happily join the game. And, uh, and we're right there in the game. So uh, let me just make the screen a little bit bigger so you guys can see a little bit better. It's always fun. So if you're not okay, it's not a, you know nothing about the game. We already been already you know been attacked by somebody. So if you're not familiar with the game, it's a kind of you know explore built in um, sort of a game in a, in a kind of retro style, pixelated style. So let me just get away from everybody else. And what we can do basically, and Jesus, you know, there's so many guys here. They're gonna kill me right away uh, because it's night. You know, if you're familiar with Minecraft, if it's night, it's full of um, of the bad guys and um let's see if i can actually make it a day and um let's see if it worked or not i don't know exactly where we are with all of this so apparently it did work but i kind of got killed so let me again I just issued the command. I just want to make sure that it would work. There's this delay. For some reason it doesn't work. Let me just see what's happening here. All right, maybe it's not the right command. Let's see if this works. Oh yeah, finally. So I got myself a a morning time frame that most of the monsters will go away. Now I can basically say, uh, give me iron sword if I can survive. You know, and I cannot survive. Okay, give me. I can't even type enough iron sword. That should be a lot better. And again, for some reason, there's this delay. It's like, okay, now I got iron sword. And I can basically uh, now defend myself a little bit better. Now, uh, you probably noticed that I actually just type in commands, right? You know, I was typing like, you know, make it morning, you know, I can say make it rain, okay, you know, start rain or give me this, give me that. None of those, none of those are actually embedded commands. The commands on the Minecraft uh, are very, are, are kind of, you know, archaic and arcane uh, and something you have to remember. Now, those commands is exactly what NLP Craft integration really provides you with. You can really type in a very uh, normal commands, right? For example, we can go back here and, you know, I don't know, say, make it rainy. And we're going to start rain for us. Um, see, it's just the rain goes and and uh, we can probably, again, uh, make it sunny. Hopefully, it's going to stop the rain again. And, uh, and the rain stops. So none of those commands are actually part of the Minecraft, right? You know, you have those commands, but you have to follow a special syntax. I never remember the syntax and whatnot. So let's take a look, actually, uh, what's behind, uh, behind the curtains here and, and what's under the hood. So uh, the... The, the entire source code, as a matter of fact, is very short. It's what's surprising for most of the folks. So this is essentially a 
model. And remember that in, uh, in LP craft speak, the model essentially is a Java code. I mean, it's a GVM code, right? Any language. And uh, specifically here, you know, you can load model from YAML or JSON files. You don't have to specify everything in this, in, in the code. You can just have a YAML file that defines most of the static configuration, if you will. And really only leave intents and the logic behind those intents in your code. Rest of it can be any way you like, like JSON and YAML. Um, and that's about it. So let's talk with this model. It's probably the most important piece. And that's a very short model. It's literally the entire source code for this model you've seen. And there's a lot more actually intense supported here. We have four intents, which we'll look at. It's about 170 lines of code. That's all there is to it, including all the comments. So I can briefly kind of tell you what's happening here. So in this subsection element, and this is the YAML file, uh, we define a bunch of elements. And the element is your kind of building block for intents. You know, technical name for them is a named entity. It's kind of you know, a big difference between you know, a classic computational linguistics where you're dealing with verbs and nouns and adjectives in, a, in a, what's called semantic modeling. Typically, what we do today, most of us, is we deal with semantic entities. Sometimes, okay, again, we call them named entities. Essentially, those things that have you know, a meaning in the real world. Like, for example, here, player. And we define a player as, you know, essentially, it's either I, me, or my, or, and this is synonymous for this, or we define this essentially as a, a pound sign and any of the regular expressions here. This is the, some of the markers we use, which we define as well here. And there's a bunch of other items, like, you know, item in a, in a, in a item in a Minecraft is, a, you know, like a hungry, long list of items you can grab. And you, we use a programmatic loader for that. So we don't really have to specify them manually everywhere. We just load them up from a JSON file. Same as a block. Minecraft is full of different blocks like sand and wood and gold and ore and whatnot. And we load them up dynamically. And then there's all kinds of different elements we try and detect in, um, in, in a, in an input, right? It's, it's, a, it's an action for the weather, like set weather and you know, uh, make it cast the rain and whatnot. You know, we define rain as, you know, with these synonyms. Uh, we define, you know, all the different words and, and really entities uh, for the weather effects and, and phenomen, uh, phenomena or time actions and whatnot. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, really short and quick uh, named entities. And by the way, uh, you can see that we define them right here with the synonyms. There's a lot of tooling in LT Craft to help you out with this. Don't think that you have to know it somehow grab every synonym you, you can imagine for a particular word. You can start with some, and there's a quite a bit of a tooling that allows you to basically quickly figure out the missing synonyms based on you know BERT and other uh, models that we employ internally. So this is an interesting one. Um, if you look at this, um, the action GIF, right? Remember when I say give me an iron sword. Um, this is how it's defined, and that's a little bit different. You probably can notice. So it has the word GIF, very simple. Uh, but it also has this instruction over here with this, you know, um, double up of carrots. This is basically an ideal expression, and this is one that's important here. So basically we're saying, so the, the GIF action element consists of two sort of uh, parts. The first part is the word GIF in, uh, in a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of limitized version of it. Uh, and then essentially any other token that has an idea of MC player. And MC stands for Minecraft. And if we look at the MC player, we'll look at the beginning. It's this element right here. And that's actually one of the unique capabilities of NLP Craft. And again, for many of you, if you're not familiar with NLP sort of a world that may not sound like a big deal, but that's what we call the composable named entities, is where you write in the, you know, write in a YAML or anywhere else in JSON or any code, you can define a new element, new named entity based on existing ones right here. And by the way, this, you know, this function is one of the, or, or I think 200 functions right now. There's, you know, a tremendous flexibility in the ADL language. I can define uh, these entities or, uh, or intents. We use exactly the same intent by the language for intents as well. So uh, that's actually fairly unique. And you can see this technique used, you know, in many different places. I, I, I'm sorry to inter interrupt but there. Not uh, with NLP. 
uh, ecosystem that may not sound like a big deal, believe me, uh, it is a big deal. The named entities typically is a very convoluted process of creating corpus and training data and neural networks and whatnot. Ability to define and compose them in like a Lego blocks is a very big deal here. So we define all those different uh, elements, and then uh, the uh, Nicola again. I'm sorry to interrupt, impact. but but you obviously and again, can't see my message, but we're, the we're running out of time. We're actually used, and you can see it's really defined in a very similar way, the same kind of ideal language. So given ten has a four terms, four parts, all of them have to be found to put intents to trigger. Um, and it's very simple, right? We we can basically look at it. the first term has to be a give action, I you know talking the Second one should be a numeric value. Uh, then we should be some kind of item from uh, NLP craft world, and then potentially a block. So basically give me the item sort. Uh, That's exactly what I can say, basically give me five item sorts that will also match this in time. Now, where it's used, where is the actual logic of all of this? The logic actually is, exists in a, in a, a I think it's Kotlin-based, Kotlin-based model. Again, this is exactly the entire source code for the entire thing. So remember this, this is your entire model, about 170 lines of code. And this is your entire a programmatic model where your intents actually live. And most of it is just a, basically a samples of intents. So if you take a look at the uh, give intent, this is exactly what it is. So it's all based on annotation. So we attach the intent to the intent callback method through annotation. It's right here. So we say an intent reference. You can actually define intent right here. Just use a different annotation. We also give you a bunch of samples. Now samples are pretty cool. Not only they just give you the, the kind of documentation, what kind of, you know, what sort of, you know, sentences do you expect this intent to match on? You can also automatically run tests using these uh, samples, which is a very effective way to really quickly build and test your models. So not only documentation, it actually does the full automatic testing for you based on these samples. And then basically uh, in an intent callback method, this is the Kotlin callback method, nothing fancy, not, nothing fancy here. Uh, we essentially use another notation to bind found terms to the formal parameters of this method. And then over here, it's not an interesting, just a few lines of code. We just, you know, really convert the the matched intent. We convert that into the R, whatever the specific, you know, syntax for the for the um, original uh, NLP craft, I'm sorry, Minecraft command, which essentially over here. It's not a really great example because in you know, the itself command is not as complex, but, you know, for example, the time and the weather commands are fairly arcane in the Minecraft and uh, our ability to actually um, use uh, the natural language is actually pretty helpful there. So that's practically it. Again, that's how simple it is. There's quite a few, you know, there's a couple of additional classes. Like remember the loaders, uh, I showed you that load the items and blocks. This is again, just you know about 50 lines of code just to load them up from a JSON file, but that's a complete like auxiliary. But nothing, this, this is basically it, that's all there is take or takes to really add a, a natural language comprehension to something like Minecraft. Obviously there is a bit of a wiring that exists to, to really have you know, a Minecraft you know, plugin to sort of accept those commands, send them to the rest, but that's, that's a pretty benign, you know, uh, just a few dozen lines of code to do that. So the bulk of it is right here in the model, which is again, and this example is just a YAML file. And by the way, if you're interested in how it's loaded up, it's right here. So when we instantiate the Minecraft model, we simply give it a Minecraft YAML file name, and it loads up all the, this static configuration, if you will, right from this file. And uh, the, on the entire logic of the model is right here in one file. And again, it's pretty simple. It's pretty simple for this example, obviously. Uh, but it's, if you look at you know, all other examples in the Minecraft project, you can see that basically it's it, it's going to strike you, uh, you know, as extremely efficient. And that's what the goal of this whole project is to really provide you this kind of a modern efficiency and, you know, least amount of code you have to develop without, you know, take away any of your functionality or, or capabilities. So uh, I think that's about the time I have since we're taking like a 10 minutes to set up, a, you know, our ideas. 
So I want to thank you very much. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too fast and hopefully you guys can glean uh, some features and some capabilities uh, and I kind of whether you're interested in this. Obviously, look, we're SF projects, so we're all about community. Join us on the dev list. Uh, look at the our website. Uh, we're pretty proud to have a fairly uh, complete website with a lot of documentation, a lot of examples, a lot of information. So with that, I want to thank you, everybody, for joining and having a good luck. I don't know how to relieve this, but you know, I'm going to be here for a couple of minutes if anybody has any questions. I mean, I'm going to hang out in the chat area, but I'm going to click on leaving right now. So thank you very much again.